Okay, so now we're gonna have our introduction to hydronic heating right now, so you can understand what that means. Uh, introduction to high, uh, hydronic heating on page, uh, what we got here? Page uh, 968. Hydronic heating is which water or steam is used to heat pipes to a place that needs to be heated. In hot hydronic terms, uh, systems, heat and circulated through pipes is called a terminal unit. So where the unit is in the room that's giving off the heat where the water goes and comes back out, that's called a terminal unit. All right, the cooler water is then returned back to the heat source. All right, sometimes they call them radiators, they call them different things. Now, water that is heated can be come from a different heat sources. Electric heat, oil heat, and gas heat. Sensing elements start and stop the heat source to the water temperature. According to the water temperature, water circulates through the system with one or more centrifugal pumps and th thermostatically controlled zone valves go to different rooms in the house. You can see that in the picture, <clears throat> figure 33.1 at the top of page 97. So water or steam carries heat through pipe and areas to be heated. Terminal units are located in the heated spaces. Systems designed to handle multiple zones. Water can be heated using a number of sources. Okay, and you, you see how these different zones are? And they got the different temperatures for them. The boiler cycles on and on off, water circulated through the system with pumps. Now, the next session says, what is a boiler in its most simplest form the explanation is an appliance that heats water using oil, gas, or electricity as the heat source. Okay, your first code word is paper cut. Now, when one fuel is used more readily available than another, it can be changed over. In older hot water heaters, conventional ballers were about 180 degrees, but the new ones anywhere from 90 to 200. The temperature of the water returning to the boiler affects the operation of the boiler. The water coming back affects the operation of the boiler. Look what it says. As well as the process of removing flue gases. As the temperature of the return water to the boiler decreases, the temperature of the flue gases is permitted to drop below 130. This causes it to condense. Most boilers classified as conventional boilers are designed to operate with a flue temperature above 130. So conventional is above 130 and it doesn't condensate. Okay, the dew point temperature, okay. Non-condensing boilers are designed with efficiencies of about 86%. Now, what's a condensing boiler at the bottom of 971? These are classified as 90 plus efficiency. These are the ones that are cooler than 130 and condense. So they'll have a pipe connected to the flue vent um, that is um, bringing the condensing unit out. Now, uh, the hot gases pass over the heat exchanger, cooling the water. The heat exchanger absorbs more heat from the gases. Look at cast iron boilers. Two classifications for cast iron boilers. That's a picture of one, 33.7.8. So let's catch up on our little things here. Boilers appliance that heats water using oil, gas, electricity. Some can use more than one source. Conventional water is about 180. Um, cast iron boilers are more commonly found in residential and with a steel boiler. So let's go to cast iron, page um, 972, that's what cast iron looks like. And look what it says. These come in dry base and wet base types. The dry base means this area under the combustion chamber is dry. No water's there. Wet base boilers, the water being heated is located above 
and below the combustion area. The more sections the boiler has, the more capacity it has to heat. With a steel boiler, water being heated within the boilers, surrounds a bundle of tubes through which the combination of uh, combustion gases pass on the way to the chimney through a series of baffles. Okay, that's a steel boiler. Um, if you look at uh, 3388, there's a um, wet uh, boiler that's and 33.9 is a steel boiler and you can see the tubes in that steel boiler. Okay, I don't think this thing has any pictures, but it's right there in your book. Okay, steel boiler. It, that's the one using the tubes. It has less surface area than cast iron and steelers. Okay, now let's get to this page right here, 972, and talk about copper water tubed boilers. The heat exchange in a copper tube boiler is constructed in a series of finned copper tubes. That means copper tubes with fins on it to help with the heat exchange. It has less surface area than the other boilers, but since copper is such a great conductor of heat, it heats the water quickly with more efficiency. Wow. Quicker and more efficient. You know, that's good. Now, let's talk next about... There's copper. That's all in your page right now. Expansion tank. What's an expansion tank? This is what one looks like. You're starting to see them now. They're code on your um, hot water heaters. Well, they have them on boilers in these things too. And look what it says on there for expansion tank. Hot water systems or closed loop systems. You ask me what is a closed loop? The water comes from the boiler, goes through the piping and comes right back. And it's reused. As the water is heated, it expands in the system. Since it's totally air free and has uh, no inlet and outlet, the pressure in the piping circuit will increase. As it's heated, it expands. The excess pressure in the system will cause the pressure relief to valve to open every time, except when you install a compression expansion tank. There are two types of these that accommodate this overload of heated water pressure. The first one, called a compression tank, is just a tank. Nothing more than a steel tank. Upon insulation, it's filled with atmospheric air. That means the pressure around you. Water is then added. As it heats up, it just creates a space cushion. Very simple. The next one is the diaphragm. Rubber, semi-permeable membrane within its shell. One side of the tank contains pressurized air. The other side is open to the water. The air portion of the tank is pressurized by the factory, normally up to 12 PSI air for residential. The tank pressure is noted on the name of the tank itself. And that's a picture of it in 3315. Now you can see here on this picture of the expansion tank that we have the def uh, we talked about the description of it. Here is that um diaphragm in here, both sides of the empty tank. And notice it says model number and there's your 12 PSI pre-charged to gas pressure. And it's written right there on the label. Yeah. Okay, so that's the expansion tank. Now let's look at the next section here called um, to determine the actual pressure for the expansion tank, we must measure vertical distance between the highest pipe of the inlet and then use it for the formula, which is right here. Oh no, look at that! Okay, I know it looks like it's hard, but it's not, it's not difficult. Okay, so let's work this map together and make it easy for ourselves. Okay, so your book says, on page 975, follow along with that uh, P tank. 2.31 is the amount of vertical lift we need for each pound of pressure. 
plus 5 is added pressure. P equals tank. Pressure in the tank. H equals height. And P is the formula. If we take these, and here's our formula. So let's look what your book says. Your book gives you a, actually a description here, doesn't it? It says, consider for a moment that you have the boilers located in the basement. The opening of the expansion tank is four feet from the basement ceiling. Dome has two floors with non-foot ceilings. The second floor has the highest pipe is two foot. Remember what it said about the highest pipe before in the last video? So here we go. We got two rooms, one and two, both nine foot tall. The boiler's located four foot below basement level. The terminal number uh, one is on the first floor and terminal number two is on the second floor and the highest pipe is two foot above the ceiling floor. This is what your book's describing, even though they don't draw it. I didn't draw any return pipes because they don't have them. They don't have them in this uh, scenario here. They didn't add that in. So let's go ahead and do the math. Your book says right there on 975, if you follow along, from this, we can conclude the H measurement is four foot of vertical lift, nine foot, Pipe continues to go up, and two foot is the highest pipe. So our height total is 15 foot of vertical lift. Now we have the height, so we can add that in. 15 divide 2.31. Do it's in the parentheses first. That gives us 6.49. Now, we add the plus five. So we get the height, six plus equals five. And now pressure of our expansion tank here is at 11.49. That's what your book is doing here, okay?